Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Turning now to the Middle East, Israel is dealing with enemies both inside and outside the country, facing a possible war with Hezbollah in Lebanon, while also taking out terrorists in Gaza. Israel says it targeted and killed a number of significant Hamas terrorists who were operating from a command and control center embedded in a humanitarian area in Khan Yunis. According to the IDF, the terrorists had carried out attacks against IDF troops from the control center and were directly involved in the execution of the October 7th massacre. The Gaza Health Ministry says at least 19 people were killed in the strike on the tent encampment. But Israel says it took numerous steps to limit the risk of harming civilians. Attorney Yifas Sigal from the Israel Defense and Security Forum tells CBN News that terrorists have one aim. You have a, a death cult of jihadist terrorists who, who literally wake up in the morning every day and try to figure out a way to bypass your um, defense mechanisms and to find a way to finally destroy you and kill and rape and destroy the state of Israel and all its people. We've been saying it for years, but we sounded crazy. But we saw it on October 7th. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant reiterated Israel's goals of destroying Hamas and bringing the hostages home and the possibility of war with Hezbollah in the north. We're looking at all the fronts, and this means that while you're fighting here in Gaza, we're preparing for everything that could happen in the north. Hezbollah continues to attack northern Israel daily from Lebanon, launching 30 missiles on Sunday alone. Netanyahu is promising to end that threat, and his war cabinet met this weekend to discuss a possible ground invasion into Lebanon. And former war cabinet member Benny Gantz says, without a hostage deal, Israel should go to war with Hezbollah. While some 60,000 Israelis are displaced from their border homes, Another 200,000 are within striking range of Hezbollah. Sarit Zahavi of the Alma Center says Israel is already in a war with Hezbollah since October 8th, but says Israel needs to hit Hezbollah harder in Lebanon. Same uh, war of attrition in the past 11 months. The only difference is that we see more shooting to areas that are not evacuated, like where I live. There was a hit of a drone in a building of 13 floors. The drone struck in the middle of the day, damaging the building but causing no injuries. Meanwhile, Turkey's president accuses Israel of wanting to take over the Middle East and is calling for a coalition of all Islamic states. They are already declaring that they will not be satisfied with occupying Gaza alone. That is why we say that Hamas is resisting on behalf of all Muslims. This is why we say that Hamas is defending not only Gaza, but also the lands of Islam and Turkey. But Zahavi says the world needs to understand who is really behind the war and what it's about.
I want to see everybody understand that it is not about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's not about a two-state solution. It's not about Gaza or Palestinians. There is a campaign that was launched by Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, against the Western representative in the Middle East, which is the state of Israel. There is a prophecy that many end-time scholars believe to be a future war involving Israel and the surrounding Muslim nations, as we read in Psalm 83, 1-8. through 8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. These are the modern day nations listed in Psalm 83 who want to cut Israel off from being a nation. Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Gaza. Is it possible Psalm 83 is a future prophecy on the verge of finding fulfillment? Turkey's president accuses Israel of wanting to take over the Middle East and is calling for a coalition of all Islamic states. They are already declaring that they will not be satisfied with occupying Gaza alone. That is why we say that Hamas is resisting on behalf of all Muslims. This is why we say that Hamas is defending not only Gaza, but also the lands of Islam and Turkey. After more than a decade of hostility between Turkey and Egypt, ties appear to be on an upward trajectory. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah Assisi is meeting with his Turkish counterpart, Tayyip Erdogan, in Ankara on Wednesday. In his first visit to Turkey in 12 years, the two met back in February, as Erdogan marks his first trip to Egypt since 2012, marking a major step in rebuilding ties that were severely strained for a decade. We have upgraded our high-level strategic cooperation council to the level of presidents. I told my dear brother El Sisi that I expect him to visit Ankara at the first opportunity to hold the council meeting. I believe that this visit will be a new turning point in our relations. The Turkish presidential office said the two leaders were set to discuss bilateral relations, escalating tensions in the region, and, quote, the Israeli attacks on Gaza and the occupied Palestinian territories. I express our pride in the level of cooperation between Egypt and Turkey for the rapid entry of the largest possible amount of humanitarian aid into Gaza Strip, taking into account the restrictions imposed by Israeli authorities on the entry of aid which caused trucks to enter at a slow pace. In Ankara, the two are expected to sign various agreements to boost military, economic and energy cooperation as once frozen relations between the regional rivals continue to thaw. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Russia is accusing Ukraine of launching a major drone attack over Moscow and other parts of Russia. Russia's defense ministry says it downed 144 drones and at least 20 drones flew over Moscow. They're saying there's one of the biggest drone attacks on Russia since the start of this war. We certainly can't think of one that's been big. As you say, at least 20 drones were shot down in the Moscow region alone. That's according to the local authorities there, over 140 into Russia overall. We saw these astonishing images of this apartment block in the Russian capital that was hit apparently by a drone, although of course it could have been air defense. Uh, the drone apparently crashing into it, killing one woman. One of Moscow's airports also was hit in this attack. Ukraine, interestingly, over the last few weeks has been repeatedly hitting Russia in an attempt to try and bring the war home to the Kremlin and to the Russian people. What they're trying to do is target what they say are strategic targets within inside, uh, inside Russia. We see in oil depots, uh, military infrastructure, all also been targeted. Russia has largely been insulated, I think, from this war since it started, but now we're seeing it coming home. These malnourished infants have been receiving care at a children's hospital in Port Sudan. Just some of the casualties of the devastating 16-month-long war that's wrecked the country. On a visit to the hospital, the director general of the World Health Organization said insufficient action was being taken to stop the conflict as he spelled out the scale of the crisis. Sudan's conflict has so far killed more than 20,000 people. This is an underestimate, by the way. Displaced over 10 million people inside the country and forced 
another 2 million to flee to neighboring countries. This is the largest internal displacement of people in the world today. Sudan was plunged into chaos in April last year when tensions between the military and the powerful paramilitary group, the Rapid Support Forces, exploded into open warfare across the country. UN-backed human rights investigators have urged the creation of an independent and impartial force to protect civilians, accusing both sides of war crimes, but in particular the Rapid Support Forces, of crimes including rape, sexual slavery and persecution on ethnic grounds. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Christians would be persecuted as we read in Matthew 24, 9, and Luke 21, 12. Matthew 24, 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 21, 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. The military junta in Myanmar, also known as Burma, is intensifying its attacks against Christians and other ethnic minorities. Chuck Holton recently witnessed the brutal crackdown, which included airstrikes and artillery assaults on Christian civilians. He brings us this report as he accompanied the Free Burma Rangers into the combat zone. Deep in the mountains of eastern Burma, gunfire echoes through Christian villages. The Burmese army is driving thousands from their homes as it seeks to crush opposition to the 2021 coup. Rebel armies, though, are slowly liberating village after village. Right now, we are attacking to Luigo, the capital city of the Korean state. Before that, uh, the Burma army put in their troops surrounded Luigo because uh, Luigo is the, the main command center of all their troops. So we are right now attacking to Luigo, their main center. So we are pushing them back. So they have to fall back all the time. For years, the Burmese army has committed atrocities against civilians, deliberately targeting churches and other religious sites. The people living in these villages in the mountains of Burma still live pretty primitive lives. You can tell by the huts that they live in. They're just made of split bamboo. Most of them don't have electricity or running water. And so you might be surprised to find a giant Baptist church built on the top of the hill in this very remote place in the mountains of Burma. That's because most of these hill tribes are actually Christian. They were converted to Christianity by the very first Baptist missionary, Adoniram Judson, in the end of the 19th century. And that's one of the reasons why there has been this conflict ongoing between them and the Buddhist military junta who controls the country. This church and this village lost over 100 homes burned and destroyed and over 100 landmines found, including in the church property, including in the church. Despite the danger, the NGO called the Free Burma Rangers is using its resources to evacuate civilians and deliver life-saving relief. During the mission, Burmese make fighter jets supplied by Russia hunted the group. So we have a recon plane flying over, trying to find this convoy, I'm pretty sure. We've been going this all day. Thank you. Normally they fly, they all, after that will come airstrikes, airplanes. And then these planes can also drop mortars. Many of the minority groups have taken up arms, resisting the dictatorship for decades. Now their aging weaponry is no match for the junta's modern arsenal. So this is an M16A1 rifle. And you can tell how old it is by looking at all the bluing is rubbed off of the upper here. And these things were probably left behind at the end of the Vietnam War. That's how old they are. You can tell if you look inside here that the chamber is clean and well oiled. Uh, these guys, this is life or death for them. And so they take very good care of their weapons. As the conflict rages, these resilient ethnic groups remain determined to resist this military rule. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you 
and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3 1 Corinthians 12.26 And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Psalm 9.17 The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. This morning, the fire danger in California is rising along with the temperature. The state has eight wildfires burning right now. One of them started late yesterday in Orange County, south of Los Angeles. The National Guard is helping nearly 2,000 firefighters tackle the Lion Fire, which has forced thousands out of their homes east of L.A. Across Southern California, crews are scrambling to contain several major fires. In Orange County, the airport fire erupted late Monday rapidly spreading across hundreds of acres in just two hours. Mandatory evacuation orders were issued for nearby neighborhoods. And east of L.A., more evacuations as the line fire continues to grow. Everything's a little frantic. This is not the first time Anthony Hogue and his family have had to pack up and get out. They evacuated four years ago during the El Dorado fire. We had everything packed up. Um, like ready to go last night. We were worried that something was gonna happen overnight. A scorching heat wave and bone dry vegetation are fueling the fires and causing unpredictable conditions for firefighters. What is the biggest challenge facing firefighters right now? So the biggest challenge is the unknown. We can't predict if it's gonna head to the west or the east. Firefighters were caught off guard when flames pushed up against them as they battled the bridge fire in LA County. That fire is burning out of control in the Angeles National Forest. And in neighboring Nevada, the Davis fire outside Reno has sent as many as 14,000 people and a herd of wild horses fleeing the flames. To the raging wildfire in Southern California, thousands have been forced from their homes, with others warned they may need to evacuate. It has been one of the hottest fire seasons in years. Tens of thousands of structures are being threatened by multiple fires. Uh, you see how the line fire, heat from that fire, has melted this fence in this San Bernardino County neighborhood, homes nearby. Thousands of people have already been displaced. Thousands more told to be ready. This morning, over 36,000 structures in San Bernardino County, California, now threatened by wildfires, prompting the governor to declare a state of emergency. Residents in nine areas under immediate evacuation orders, with several nearby areas warned they might be next. The National Guard coming in to assist in the response. It's almost like the world's ending. <laughs> it looks like that. It smells like that. The line fire, about an hour east of L.A., burning more than 40 square miles in just five days. It's only 5% contained, with over 1,700 people deployed to fight it. This fire continuing to burn here in San Bernardino County. More than 12,000 people have already been ordered to flee. Thousands more have been told to be ready as this fire continues to burn out of control. Overnight, the airport fire in Orange County growing rapidly in size after sparks from heavy equipment set the area ablaze. The flames seen here encroaching on radio and cell towers atop Mount Santiago prompting the evacuation of more than 1,400 homes. Poor air quality and limited road access has forced the closure of schools in at least two districts. The fire coming as the area deals with record-setting heat. Downtown L.A. hitting 105 degrees on Monday. It's almost like the world's ending. <laughs> it looks like that. It smells like that. In the news these days, we read about and see devastating events, each more unusual, destructive, and unprecedented than the last. They are happening more frequently and more intensely, just as the Bible said would happen just before the return of Jesus Christ. These devastating events are not accidents, nor are they merely the natural cycle of things. The world is enduring events that are designed to bring about the end of days and cause us to repent. God is lifting his hand of protection from the nations of the world. No, things will never get back to normal. They will only get worse. As the birth pains continue to become more frequent and more intense, one has to wonder, how close are we to the rapture and the seven-year tribulation? Joel 1.15 Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. 
it shall come as destruction from the Almighty. The force of Typhoon Yagi has been relentless, causing havoc wherever it struck. <laughs> when motorists tried to cross this bridge in Vietnam, it simply collapsed. As the truck in front of them crashes into the swollen river, the people filming slowly reverse to safety. Survivors could not believe they escaped. Both me and the vehicle fell into the river. I thought I was at the bottom or near the bottom. I tried my best to float to the surface. I was out of breath. When I was on the surface, I still thought I would not be able to survive. I was so scared when I fell down. I feel like I've just escaped death. I can't swim and I thought I would have died. Elsewhere, the storm has left a trail of destruction, smashing through villages and causing landslides. Authorities say, as well as the loss of life, thousands of homes have been damaged and this year's crops have disappeared under a brown sea of flood water. Yagi has been the region's most powerful typhoon this year and it made landfall along the northeastern coast over Vietnam at the weekend. It had earlier passed through China, smashing everything in its path. The storm has now weakened to a tropical depression, but with homes still without power, scientists are warning that because of climate change, these destructive weather events will become more frequent. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16, 21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for not recognizing the signs of his first coming as we read in Matthew 16, 1-3. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning... It will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. The religious leaders of Jesus' day had full knowledge of the prophecies of the Messiah. Yet these religious leaders ignored the signs and still rejected him. If the religious leaders of Jesus' day missed the signs of Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to pay close attention to the signs of Jesus' second coming? The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, 
But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.